All right. Hello. We are live on the Zoom call, and we are Just Be Well. I'm Tom Salt, a medical doctor and functional medicine practitioner. I'm Elizabeth, a registered nurse and whole life coach. And so if you can let us know, if you can hear us, that would be great. Maybe just give us something in the chat. And... Um, so far, I'm failing at uh, how to do this. Where'd my thing go? <laughs> so, there we go. All right. So, uh, tonight we're going to talk about Lyme disease. We're going to talk about... Um, how to improve um, you know, your energy level, your body aches, your Herxheimer's, and even your brain fog um, without any drugs. So um, we're on a little getaway. We're down in Stillwater, Minnesota, and outside of our normal environment. So we've got uh, a really bright white right behind us <laughs> and not entirely ideal sort of circumstance, but it's what we're working with. So um, if you have questions or comments, let us know. I, I want to start by just talking about Lyme disease in general and people who are, there you go, um, people who are suffering, we're struggling with the technology here. Sorry about that. Just making sure nobody's waiting on us. Yeah, just making sure nobody's waiting in the waiting room, but I think it'll come up like those <laughs> others have. In any event, um, so we want to talk about um, the limbic system. We want to talk about a program we've put together, which actually costs nearly nothing. There's a few things to buy in terms of some supplements and some, and a device, a biofeedback device, but you can implement it very inexpensively on your own. And then, of course, if you want, you can get coaching from us, but it's not necessary. We're, uh, we're too, we're sunk down in this couch so far. I feel like I'm a little, little, little Edith Ann in the old um, lap band or whatever it was. But anyway, um, the issue here is the limbic system and how the limbic system is basically a switchboard deep, deep, deep in your brain. And that switchboard um, can get stuck. And when it gets stuck, it causes pro-inflammatory chemicals to be created, um, anti or oxidative chemicals to be created, um, inflammation stuff to be created. And so it's everything bad. And reorienting and reorganizing that um, helps. I want to give you a couple of stories about how that can be. Just last week, I think it was, maybe it was two weeks ago, there was a, publish, a paper published um, which showed that what you think about what you're going to eat affects your blood sugar more powerfully than actually what you're eating. In other words, uh, the study was done like this. Um, they told people that they were getting a, um, a food that had a lot of carbs in it, and they ate it, and then they checked their blood sugar. This other group got exactly the same food. They were told it was a very low-carb food, and then they got their blood sugar checked. And the people who believed that they were eating a low-carb food had lower blood sugars than the people who ate the exact same food when they were told it was a high-carbohydrate food. And that segues, go ahead. Yeah, and actually I think in the study, they actually um, also did the exact same person, gave them the same beverage they had previously had, but yet told them this time that it was like a, you know, like a, a sugar-free soda instead of the, the full sugar soda. So it was the same participant and the blood sugar had a huge different. difference. Right. Yeah. right. So Just by what they thought they were getting. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. There's a little tiny town uh, in uh, rural Pennsylvania called Rosito. Rosito is a mining town. And um, the local doctor there realized that there was a group of residents who just weren't getting heart disease. 
the Belgians, when they were coming along and they were getting their fair share of heart disease, but these Italians, these Italians were not getting heart disease. And so uh, a decades long uh, investigation ensued and they, they looked at, well, it's gotta be their cholesterol. Well, no, the cholesterols were the same. It's gotta be their lifestyle. Well, they were smoking and drinking like the Belgians and so on and so forth. And so um, when it was all said and done, can you do that? Cause I can't talk and <laughs> um, when it was all said and done, uh, it was community. It was a sense of purpose and place uh, and purpose uh, that was keeping their blood sugars and their cholesterol and their, or their risk for heart disease down. So for those of you who are just joining us, we're talking about the story of the town of Rosito. And there's a wonderful book and called, uh, called The Rosito Story. Uh, it's on Amazon if you want to look at it. But this is, a, we're talking about the power of the mind and not that Lyme disease is in your head to the extent that there are spirochetes in your head, Lyme disease is in your head. But, you know, to the extent that um, it's an infectious disease that's real, we're not talking about psychiatric illness. We're talking about the power of the brain. So then I want to take you, I'm going to take you on a little tour. Uh, I want to talk about another book. So that was the book called Rosito Story. And we also talked about the paper about the carbohydrates. There's a book entitled The Conscious Universe. And there are two of these books. One is about sort of magical stuff. And, but this one isn't. This is by, um, well, I better make it big because I can't read it. By um, Kafatos, K-A-F-A-T-O-S, um, and N-A-D-E-A-U. Good luck saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, these two guys uh, were formerly, uh, and I think one of them still is, uh, professors at the University of California, um, Santa Cruz. They're physicists. They were previously employed in the semiconductor industry, and they're, they're, you know, they're real physicists. And they've written this book called The Conscious Universe because the deepest theories of quantum mechanics are really, they're just like, they're, Quantum mechanics is only a description of reality. It isn't, you know, we don't know what these things are, these quantum particles and so on. But it appears to require consciousness, which is very strange. But the way you set up the experiment, the way you believe the experiment is going to um, happen influences the results. Looking influences the results. So that's, that's these guys um, the conscious universe. And so that's really interesting because there's another idea in quantum physics known as um, the unified field theory. The unified field theory is that basically things like electrons, an electron is a fundamental particle. An electron emerges from this unified field into an electron field. And every electron in the universe is actually one thing. And then it gets even stranger because every quark and every muon and so on are each of those is one thing, all of them in the entire universe. And this is how this idea of entanglement happens because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But if you're talking about just one thing, then it's not traveling, even though it appears that you're entangling. I'm probably going crazy because you may not know what I'm talking about at all. <laughs> which is often what she tells me. But the point of this is things can become entangled, which means that they interact and influence each other at great distances, like across the universe. And at the Big Bang, at the moment of the Big Bang, everything in the universe was actually massively entangled and still is. Um, so there is then this next idea by um, a guy named Philip Goff, who wrote an interesting book, a little dense book, but another interesting book entitled Galileo's Error. And Galileo's Error is about how um, Galileo decided that science would only deal with the behavior of things and not the nature of things. And so if Galileo is only interested in the behavior of things and not the nature of things, there's a whole litany of things that, that science doesn't deal with. And 
emergent from this idea of the conscious universe and of this, the ideas in Galileo's error is this concept of panpsychism. Panpsychism is the idea that consciousness itself is an emergent property of the universe. So matter has consciousness. In fact, um, Penrose, Sir Roger Penrose is a physicist, another physicist. And he is, has a, a theory that the microtubules inside our neurons are actually quantum antennas to oversimplify it. And that we actually process information through a quantum computer state in our brains. And that's why we can do things that are non-algorithmic. So I'm trying to lead you through a path. Um, and hopefully the path isn't too murky but, um, or muddy. But the next step in this path is a guy by the name of Bruce Lipton, who taught actually at one of the, one of the medical schools I attended. And Bruce Lipton's um, book, uh, The Biology of Belief, is about how, again, our thoughts from a quantum mechanical point of view may influence reality and also influences biology. So this, you know, this idea, you know, the power of positive thinking or whatever, isn't just woo-woo, this is real. And the power that our subconscious mind has over our physiology is really unmeasurable. In fact, I'm among a growing group of people that believe that our subconscious influence on our biology is more powerful than our blood pressure than our cholesterol, than our high, highly sensitive C-reactive protein, than our blood sugar, any of these other things. Those things are important. They're important, but the subconscious influence is more important. So then, um, you know, Lynn McTaggart writes a book entitled The Bond, how um, there appear to be these systems of how things are interconnected. And then Finally, uh, Joe Dispenza writes a book called Becoming Supernatural, where he recounts his, um, his story of being, he was a triathlete, he gets hit by a car, he's basically crushed, he needs surgery, he refused to have the surgery, uh, goes home and just wills himself into healing. Um, so there's... And there's lots of science behind all this stuff. You know, if you start to look at Ted Kapchuk's work at uh, Harvard on the placebo effect, you start to see measurable influences. And the question is, how do we harness that? Well, we harness that through the limbic system. And our program, um, you know, Rebalance to Heal is about healing your limbic system, getting your limbic system online and, and purpose building it to help you heal. And again, this is uh, something you can do at home. It's very low cost. It uses a few supplements if you're really revved up and, and need some help supplements to kind of help calm things down. And then a biofeedback device and then some very specific training. It's all outlined for free on our website. Uh, we're not, with, you know, you can buy a M-Wave biofeedback heart rate variability about feedback from us if you want or anywhere you want to. But this is really important stuff. And a gigantic piece of the puzzle for most people who are stuck in line. And having said that, I don't mean that you don't maybe need a big course of big gun antibiotics and you don't need long-term supplements. And you, I don't mean that. I mean, you do need probably big gun antibiotics. You do need long-term supplementation, you do need all these things, but a big, big piece of it that we're overlooking and why a lot of people don't get finally well is because their limbic system remains damaged it, with these sort, if you think of it as a switchboard, the switches are just stuck open. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight is the limbic system. Any questions anybody has at any time, write them in the chat box, we're monitoring that. But um, so, you had, I think, some experience with sort of uh, Lyme and your limbic system. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything to say about that? I've, I've talked myself dry. 
<laughs> I was thinking about getting a drink and I haven't even really said anything yet. So. <laughs> now, um, I think that with uh, Lyme disease, not only did uh, my limbic system kind of keep me stuck um, in those symptoms and in that state of mind, but I can see now how it actually like perpetuated it how it was probably a huge factor in why I got sick compared to why the next person next to me didn't get sick, you mean people that were living with me. Um, so I know that uh, just, you know, even down to, um, you know, the type of personality I have, um, how I run my life, I'm kind of, I was, you know, kind of that type A1 perfectionist, and really, you know, perfectionism comes down to, you know, those things that we tell ourselves that we're never good enough. So, you know, that's the driving for perfection was just my own feelings of, you know, self-worth. And it really started with my mind and, um, you know, the things that I was saying to myself just changing those thought patterns and and actually a huge step is just the awareness of it so just kind of listening to your thoughts during the day and really it's quite shocking um the amount of not necessarily even negative self-talk but just not that you know um, positive or even constructive self-talk you know, it's not like I was telling myself I was worthless all day long. It's these little sneaky things that you don't realize that you're saying to yourself or that you're doing. So step one, I think, is awareness and um, in the Rebalance to Heal program. Uh, that's kind of what the first step is. And, and there are a few supplements that I took and that I, I am um, still taking right now since COVID came around. I kind of had to restart things a little bit just to kind of keep me in balance and keep me in check. But, um, and, you know, those three supplements really just help to kind of calm down my autonomic nervous system so I could like slow down, take a breath and kind of get back on track again. Yeah. So um, uh, that's really step one, what you've sort of described as these few supplements. So these supplements are really, um, they're sort of designed to help us uh, get out of fight or flight. So they are um, limbic system calming, they're fight or flight, autonomic nervous system calming. Um, supplements. And, yeah, and they're from herbs or foods, you know, it's not, it's not like a, a pharmacological medication. Um, it's very carefully chosen to facilitate, but not force. Mm -hmm. Support. Right. Facilitate, but not force or support, not force. So uh, there's basically two major supplements. There's three, actually. The, the, one of them is Western herbs designed to um, help with um, balancing the autonomic nervous system and adrenal um, uh, adaptogens. And then the other formula is a Eastern herbal formula designed to support yin. Um, and then um, also an, uh, an amino acid from green tea called L-theanine, which I like to describe as meditation in a bottle. Yeah, it doesn't make you drowsy. Nope. It just makes you very clear and very present. And it's very, it doesn't make you that way. It no, facilitates it, and it's, it's subtle. It's yeah, subtle. It's not subtle. like you're going to take it mm -hmm. and notice it, but you do like start to feel, okay, I'm just less reactive. Um, you know, when something, when something occurs, you're not quite like right there where you're just gonna, you know, fall off the yeah, edge. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit softer. Yep. So then step two is biofeedback and we use heart rate variability biofeedback. So heart rate variability is not like heart rate variability between 60 and 100. It's within 60. So within whatever your heart rate currently is, if you're just sitting here, your heart rate's probably 60, 70, 80, something like that. And within that number, the heartbeat just fluctuates a little tiny bit, milliseconds between beats. So this one and this one, is a little further away than the next one that's a little closer and the next one's a little further away and they just are fluctuating a little bit, a few milliseconds. And it's that variability that we're measuring and that variability is a direct measurement of the autonomic nervous system state. So we are 
using biofeedback to teach you how to get out of fight or flight. And so this device called an M-Wave helps us do that. And you know, if you think about it, bio, it, you can't really fix anything unless you can get feedback on it. So feedback means that, um, you know, if you're throwing a ball and I throw it and I accidentally hit her in the face, well, that was too far to that side. So I throw it and I miss the screen off to this side. Well, that was too far there. So I throw it again and it goes above and I throw it again and it goes below. As you can see, I'm a terrible baseball player. But I keep throwing and, and it narrows in as I get the feedback because I know, oh, I went too far right. Oh, I went too far left. Oh, I went too high. I went too low. And I get closer and closer and closer until pretty soon I know that when I throw it, if I let go right here, it's going to go right to me. And it's the same thing with this heart rate variability biofeedback. It's like, oh, the light's red. That's not right. And you can go, oh, it's not right. And it'll just get more red. Or you can laugh and think of something joyous and think of some deeply held loved one and it'll turn blue and then turn green. And then you'll learn, oh, I have to think of pleasant, nice things, not, or it's not green. Um, and when you get to the place where you're consistently able to be green, you know, you're mastering that craft. You're mastering the craft of heart rate variability. And that can take months to years off your journey, having that biofeedback device to train you rap much more rapidly how to get into the state. Right, and, and it just gives you something to concentrate on. Sometimes, you know, yep. it's hard to be mindful. It's hard to meditate. But this device is, you know, makes it a little bit more of like, an activity or, or almost like a game. Yep. I so mean, I don't control, it's a game, game, game controlled by your is. mind. Yeah. yeah um, it is. You know, it's something that you're, you know, working with how you're feeling and it even has um, different breathing rhythms. So you can work on breathing and um, yeah, I think that's really great. I really had to ask you quick is did we didn't want that in you? No. Okay. I don't know. We must sound okay. We haven't heard anything, but I just want to make sure we're not getting a... Yeah, no, I think we're okay. Uh, hopefully, if, if our sound is terrible, we're using microphones here, and, there. and occasionally they're on there too, but I turned it off, I believe, so it should be okay. Um, but in any event, so that's the really the first and second step. The first step is supplements to help you get, you know, out of the perpetual fight or flight, which almost everyone in chronic, with chronic illness, has some level of fight or flight. And then the second step is um, this biofeedback technique, which is really powerful. By the way, all of this stuff is found on our website, which is um, Just Be Well. And I wish I could navigate this better. Yeah, Just Be Well. Um, and then it's just be well that info slash rebalance dash two to dash heal H E A L. So rebalance dash two dash heal. And that'll take you to the pages necessary to go through this program. So then step three is, is your um, creation, uh, which is the sensor, what I call sensory soothing kit. I, mm -hmm. You have a different name for it. What's your name for it? Um, I just call it my grounding kit. Yeah. So just something that kind of brings me back into um, the present moment. So, you know, whether I'm in a situation that's a little bit higher anxiety or you're- Like a Zoom live kind of situation. Yeah, Zoom live on a, you know, retreat. Yeah. <laughs> and even like, no, I'm just teasing. Um, so, you know, it just, it really is a kit that you create and it's based off of the five senses um, and you know it incorporates things that kind of bring you back into balance so for me um smell i like essential oils so she was a dog in a prior life like a bloodhound or something mm -hmm. she smells everything it's i I'm, can smell ticks <laughs> yeah it's yeah yeah it's, it's amazing yeah Anyway, it's just my, okay, now that that's we got to my- That's her superpower. Yeah, my strange, quirky superpower. Yeah. Um, so I have rose essential oil because I love essential oils and roses really brings me to spe a specific place that I find very calming. Um, 
I have a couple rocks in there that have words on them that kind of do the same thing. And really, you know, you can have a kit, which I think it's great to have a kit because sometimes, you know, we just need those things, but you can do it anywhere at any time. You know, if you're feeling stressed out, there's maybe, maybe you can look out the window and you can see the clouds or the trees or whatever brings you a sense of peace. Maybe you can put on some music, some relaxing music. I think music is such a wonderful way to kind of bring me back into balance. Um, because, you know, not only can I listen to it, I can sing to it, I can move and dance to it. Um, so it really just kind of takes me out of that fight or flight and brings me into a whole different state. Um, I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, breathing, just breathing, becoming conscious of your breathing can help yeah. bring you back. So this is, um, you know, a kit you put together, or as she said, just things you become conscious of, purposefully yeah. conscious of in your, your environment. Your five senses. Just to cover your five senses so that when you're feeling like you're spinning out of control and, you know, the pain is grabbing you or a herx is grabbing you. And the problem with the limbic system is that it grabs you and then it amplifies it and then it amplifies it, and then it amplifies it, and then it amplifies it to the point where you're living at a 10 every day, right? If zero is can't, or sorry, you're living in a, well, 10 for pain, if zero is no pain at all, and 10 is the worst pain, you're, you're at a 10 all the time. Well, part of that is the amplification. You, pain is real. The pain mm -hmm. is real, but it's being amplified by your limbic system, right. and this can help turn down, take it off as in spinal tap. This, this amp goes to 11. Well, let's take it off of 11, bring it down to the maybe five or four, or if we're lucky, three or two. Um, and so that's what this is about. Yeah, and John Kabat-Zinn writes a great book about this. So, you know, he has one of the most effective pain management clinics just by using this mindfulness. Right. Um, so it's real. Um, it is something that is effective. Yeah, his program gets people who have failed all of the interventional mm -hmm. stuff. They've had all of these shots. They've had all of the nerve burning. They've had all the surgeries, all of the disc replacements, all of the laminectomies, all of the, you know, heart surgeries they're ever going to get. And um, they're, uh, they're referred to him. Mm -hmm. And what does he do? A mindfulness meditation practice. 45 minutes twice a day. That's his program. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has better statistics in terms of pain reduction than other programs that do all of the interventional stuff. So this is real. Mm -hmm. This is very, very real and very powerful. And especially for people with Lyme, because as you know, narcotics don't touch your pain, right? Or you don't tolerate them. Or you don't tolerate you don't the don't meds. You don't tolerate a lot of medications mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. So this is a way to kind of you know, step back from that if you're not tolerating it and find a different avenue. Yeah. You know, I, I have so many people say, well, sometimes the narcotics make me not care. They make me care less about the pain, but I still have the pain. And, and that's the way to live, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's um, the, the first couple of steps. Um, then are three steps. And then we go into, you know, basic foundational lifestyle stuff. And that basic foundational lifestyle stuff is the stuff we talk about on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page all the time, right? It's uh, movement and nutrition and sleep and all the things that we all know we should do. But we think, well, I'm going to get really good. I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. Well, we never count backwards from 5 a.m. to realize that that means I need to go to bed at 9 a.m. to get my full eight hours of sleep. And if you think you don't need eight hours, you're wrong. Period. There's less than 1% of the population that actually needs less than eight hours of sleep. So, or. And if you're chronically ill, hours. you're probably not one of that. Yeah, one exactly. <laughs> if, if you're chronically unwell, you're probably not one of that 1%. All right. So, um, that's the. Uh, <laughs> step. <laughs> that's, that's the some step, some step. <laughs> it's step number something. Um, yeah. So step four is the, um, 
learning healthy and healing habits. So the sleep and all that stuff. Yep. Stress management. Um, yep. Because you know, being chronically unwell leads to many things. And one of them is your inability to handle stressors. Yep. Um, and this chronic you know, inability to manage your stress in a healthy way further perpetuates those symptoms, especially like brain fog. And brain fog is, is a response. It's a response for your body. Um, largely, I think, to uh, stress. Yep. And being, being chronically unwell adds stressors, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't get your whatever it is you need to get done, right? You can't work as efficiently as you'd like, so it takes you longer. You can't clean your house as efficiently as you'd like, so it takes you longer. You can't cook as well as you'd like, so it takes you longer. And there's only so many hours a day, and you may not even be able to do many of those things. Many of my patients tell me that, you know, they're lucky on many, many days that they get from their couch to the bathroom without having a problem. So, you know, sleep and relaxation, um, and finding ways to get REM sleep. You know, and there's supplements that can help with that. There are things that can help with that. There's sleep hygiene, but you know, it's a whole program that you need to work your way through. Sleep, good sleep begins a few hours after you wake up in the morning. <laughs> you know, tonight's night's sleep, a good sleep started for me at what, we got up at six something. So seven, eight o'clock in the morning, I already have to be thinking about, well, or making it a part of my normal routine to be managing my stress all day long. So that by the end of the day, I'm not so topped out that there's like no chance I'm going to be sleeping. Right. So good sleep starts just a few hours after you wake up, maybe even before you wake up, managing your stressors all day long and so on. So um, then, you know, nutrition and immune support. So nutrition is really important for your immunity getting plenty of phytonutrients and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then... And also look at how you're eating. Yeah, thank you know, you. the yeah. state that you're eating in. <laughs> you're not going to be absorbing any of the nutrients in your food, and you're in an inflammatory state when you're eating in fight or flight. So if you have a lot of gas and bloating and mm -hmm. belching and the other end, probably you're gulping your food down probably you're just yanking it down. Now you can have dysbiosis and you can have gut problems. That's all true too. I'm not trying to minimize that, but a big part of it is, you know, if you're putting big chunks of food into your stomach, they're going to get further down into your digestive tract. And when they, the further down they get, the more bugs there are that are going to ferment them and become gas factories, right? So smaller particles, well chewed, well mixed with saliva, which is where the enzymes start, and then into your gut to sterilize it with acid and break down some of the proteins, and then into your first part of your intestines called the duodenum, where the enzymes are shoved in there to really start breaking things down, and then absorption in the small intestine. The smaller those particles are, the more efficient that process happens. If you're biting off chunks and swallowing them whole, that's not what's happening. They're getting down into your colon as big chunks left over but then get fermented and really wreak havoc. So being in a rest and digest state when you're a meal, so no more eating in your car, mm -hmm. you know, sit down, not in your car, but at a table, preferably with people you enjoy to eat your meals. Yep, and this is a great way to incorporate kind of some of those stress management practices during the day, you know, how you're preparing. Um, to sleep at night, just think about how many times you eat during the day. If you take a couple minutes before each time you consume food to take some deep breaths, really get your body in a relaxed state, you know, that's more time you have towards being in that parasympathetic versus the fight or flight. Yeah. Yeah. And so it all, it all meshes These together. These little things add up. Yeah. It's not like this huge thing, you don't have to, you know, go off to India and, um, you know, take up meditating two hours at a time. It's these little things mm -hmm. all day long that really right. help you integrate it. And so, 
Thank you for that. You don't have to meditate two hours at a time. In fact, mm -hmm. you start the M wave like five minutes, several mm -hmm. times a day, five minutes, several times a day. And then eventually we want to get you to keep doing that five minutes, several times a day. But in addition to do 20 minutes in the morning and the evening to kind of uh, really establish a practice and then get very expert at it. But five minutes, well, you know, five minutes every few hours. You know, just five minutes every few hours. Five minutes goes by faster than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So then the next um, step, the fifth step, is our AM and PM ritual, which is part of that 20 minutes. So, you know, we create this 20 minute block. Um, so here we are on step five. There's six steps total. So on the second to the last step, we're finally incorporating that 20 minute morning and evening. But even this, you start with five minutes. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening. We ask six questions. Well, maybe it's six minutes in the morning, six minutes in the evening. But we ask six questions. So the questions in this area are, what is my essence? So we're asking that question of ourselves for this moment in particular and my life in general. You know, so what is my essence? Well, I'm an ornery SOB. <laughs> okay. Is that the essence you really want, right? Is that really your core essence? Or are you just so in fight or flight and so disturbed that that's how you feel, right? Trying to get underneath how you're feeling. What's my essence? Hopefully you find that your essence is compassion or love or something like that. So what is my essence? Um, <clears throat> so then what do you do with that? Once you, how do you answer that question? What do you mean? Like you journal? Is that what you're yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sometimes in the morning we just talk about it with yeah. each other. Yeah, Sometimes we journal independently Sometimes about it. Sometimes I journal because I, I feel like, well, it, it is a different way of processing it between saying it, writing it, um, you know, uh, you know, typing it or whatever. Um, yep. So it's, yeah, it just depends on where you're at and what you're doing. And these are really great questions, I think, because it trains you to ask yourself to use them anytime during the day because they really ground you. So the word essence, you know, the essence is that thing that is unique to you, you know? And so you can say general words like, you know, compassion or love, but hopefully you can find some real core element, some kernel that you would not be you without, right? That's the idea. What is my essence? Then, you know, and you, and you meditate on that. And every day, something a little different comes up because you're in a different space, but you're just, you're setting a tone. This morning and evening rituals to set a tone. So what is my essence? And the next thing is, what is my offering? What is my offering to life and the world in general, but also today? What is my offering today? What is my offering? What is my gift? What is my gift to myself? What is my gift to my community, to my family, to my loved ones, to the world in general? What is my gift? What is my offering? And then from there, we like to take just a little bit of time. And again, all of these things, there's six items here. You can do, you know, one minute on some, 30 seconds on another, skip one one day, or you can do a whole hour on each one of them and make it a whole day's retreat if you want. So it's extremely flexible. You can, if you're like walking out the door and you go, oh, I don't have time for this nonsense. Okay, well, just think, about, think it. about it. Just mm -hmm. think about it. What's my essence? What's my offering? Mm -hmm. And then let that well up in your subconscious for a moment. And, and so we talk about doing a stream of consciousness writing or a stream of consciousness conversation about what is my essence? What is my offering? What does that mean? How does that manifest? How does it motivate? How does it create all those kinds of questions. And then um, how will I apprehend joy? And for some of you, that's a huge question because your life is not filled with joy. <laughs> Being chronically unwell is really unpleasant, right? But it's surrounding you. There is joy to be apprehended if you're present, right? If you're present, you can apprehend joy because you can seize it when it's around you, when someone smiles, when a grandchild shows up, when a child shows up, when a loved one shows up. There is joy to be had. So how will I apprehend 
joy. And then um, the last one, the second to last one. Okay. How will I manifest love? So what does that mean to you? Um, to me, manifest means bring forth. And in my mind, how will I manifest love usually that springs in me like things that I do for someone else to show that I love them. Because, um, you know, I feel like the love coming out of me to others is how I manifest love in the world. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would like to say one thing about that. Um, you posted just the other day, um, and I, I put it on our channel. I think you posted it on yours. And, and I said, um, Self-love is not self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. Self-love is the fulcrum from which everything else is accomplished. So how will I manifest love? Well, it wells up from within us mm -hmm. and it starts with self-love and then it manifests to people out among us. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes into that positive, you know, constructive self-talk as well. Yeah. That positive self constructive, yeah, yeah, what she said. <laughs> constructive self talk. And then um, the last one what do you hold in deep gratitude? You know, the other day, this is a few weeks ago, months ago, whatever, we were doing this thing, and I was just a surly SOB. I, I wasn't having a good day at all. And what am I, what am I, what am I to gratitude for? Nothing. Life sucks. I'm sick of this shit. You know, and then I started thinking, well, at least I don't live in Sarajevo during the war where if you stepped outside your home, somebody was shooting at you. That's, that's a plus. At least I don't live, you know, in, in a place where there's famine. At least I can get food. Oh, okay. I'm starting to think I've got it pretty good. You know what? Come to think of it, my, my roof doesn't leak. That's pretty good. And come to think of it, my, my heater works. And especially, well, it's a nice day today, but last week it was really cold. It was mm -hmm. nice to have a heater that worked. All of a sudden, it was like it slowly brought me around. You know, like, what a, what a, wait a minute, I got a lot. I got a lot to be, have deep gratitude for, you know? And if I'm only trying to think of three, all oh, those are past. I got those. I, I'm deeply grateful for mm -hmm. being having food and water and uh, shelter and, you know, basic survival stuff. That's just huge. That's so beautiful. So, you know, it can really pull you out of the depths of, of the doldrums. So, you know, what do I hold in deep gratitude? And this becomes part of this morning exercise. You know, you put on your M-Wave device and you start um, thinking about, you know, these, these six questions. So, you know, what is my essence? And you start thinking about that thing deep inside you and hopefully that thing that you love. And then, and then you know, what is my offering? And what is it that I am excited and, and have great passion to bring into the world? And then uh, you know, sort of a stream of consciousness surrounding that stuff. And then, you know, how am I going to apprehend joy today? How am I going to apprehend joy? And, you know, really hopefully holding that in this really positive, reverent mm -hmm. space. Because yeah, sometimes you may need to think about okay, these are the things I have to do today. That doesn't sound very joyous. But, you know, it's really about digging, okay, how am I going to bring joy into those moments of those tough things that I have to do? I apologize to the person who said this. I can't remember the name, but I love this quote. It's, uh, every morning I wake up intent on changing the world and having one hell of a good time. And sometimes that makes planning challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, but that's, that's just it. It's sometimes you have to think about it and then gratitude, holding things in gratitude. So, so that's just huge. And, you know, we're doing that with our M wave on. So we're getting feedback on our, our state of our autonomic nervous system continuously while we're going through this exercise. And then, you know, we've been doing this M wave exercise for quite some time. So we're getting more and more expert at it. And now we're doing the AM PM ritual. We're adding to that. 
And we need to spend some time there. We need to get very good at that. And we need to you know, really have a, a practice. And then we get into what we call the sixth stage, which is basically um, kind of an adaptation of Zen. So it's a non-sectarian, non-religious Zen kind of practice called koan training. And it's adopted for the West. So we're not going to ask you what's the sound of one hand clapping or those kinds of weird questions that you may have heard of about Zen. But instead, we're going to go through 13 very specific questions. And I don't think we'll take the time to go into all of them. But I just want to say that they're designed to make you aware of a deeper level of consciousness and then hopefully help, help you become aware of what your feelings are really trying to tell you. Your feelings are meant to be felt. You know, so often we try to suppress our feelings to make ourselves feel better. I'm just not going to be angry. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, your, your emotions are meant to be emoted. Your feelings are meant to be felt. And, um, but what is the information they're really trying to tell you? If you're angry, what is that trying to tell you? One of the things it's trying to tell you, it might be trying to tell you many things, but one of the things is you care deeply about what's being presented. If you didn't care, you wouldn't be angry, right? So if the issue is, oh, I'm angry. That means if you can train yourself that when you feel anger welling up, right? I'm getting angry. What does that mean? It means I care. Oh, now that I understand at a deeper level that this emotion means I care, how can I respond? I mean, I might get angry also. Maybe it's completely appropriate to be angry. But in addition, maybe in addition, maybe instead of, who knows, but how can I respond in a way that gets me further towards my goal, right? Um, how many of us grab the end of our nose, pull it out and slice it right off, right? We cut our nose off to spite our face. It doesn't get us closer to our goal. And, but it's also, it's not about becoming a robot and being emotionless. You, your emotions are meant to be emoted. Your feelings are meant to be felt. But what's the information? And what is a more useful way to respond to that of feeling of emotion rather than just exploding? Or rather than just packing it up until the point that it's packed in like dynamite, now it detonates. You know, instead of packing it all up, let's, let's, let's deal with it as it occurs instead of packing it all together. So those are, there's 13 of these, these insight trainings. And they're designed to kind of take you step by step through a process to get to the point where you understand this deeper level of emotional, emotional universe and hopefully what at a deeper level these emotions are trying to convey and communicate. And then before we get to a point where we're exploding with anger, how can we more efficiently manage um, that situation to actually obtain our goal, which hopefully has something to do with compassion and um, empathy and things like that. So that's really the program. Again, it's at um, justbewell.info slash um, rebalance dash TO dash heal. Rebalance to heal. And yeah. No, I was, I, I um, was going to add about the emotions. Uh-huh, go ahead. Um, yep. um, uh, our emotions, at least I've noticed with myself a lot of times, they're just also feedback to what I am thinking or, you know, what I'm feeling. And a lot of times that has to do with what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to kind of that self-talk and in what scenarios are you running around in your head? Um, you know, I have to look at, okay, I'm feeling really crummy about a situation. Is it, is it the situation itself? Is there an action that needs to be taken? Because when I tell my kids, you know, 
if, if you're complaining about something, it's fine. Like you can, you can voice that you don't care for something or that something is bothering you. But also if you're not going to do anything about it, then, then you can't complain anymore. And you know, so those scenarios in my head, is it, you know, maybe there's nothing I can do about it. So maybe I need to change my perspective about it, or maybe I just need to change the way I am, you know, running that scenario in my head. Right. You know, we, there, there are, um, there's an old saying, uh, if you're, if you're stressed out and you analyze the situation and there's something you can do about it, well then do it. Right. If you analyze the situation and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, how is being stressed helping anyone involved, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of get, you need to get clear on uh, the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The strength to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference, which is why I call it the wisdom prayer, because the key to that is the wisdom to know the difference, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the trick, and that's what all of these insights are trying to help us get to a place of wisdom to know the difference, and then to take initiative where we need to, to change the things that can be changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your body is always listening. You know, the cells in your body are listening to you. They're listening to your thoughts. The body keeps score. What mm -hmm. is that the name of the book? I think that's the name of a book, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, beautiful book about the body keeps score. And you know, there's, you know, we're both readers, so there's a million and two books that we'd love to talk to you about, but we are kind of at the end of our time. So if you if you um really take this seriously, you know, people say, well, just get over it. No, that's not what we're saying. You know, no. just get over it. No. We're saying you're sick, you have a real illness, it's serious, it's bad, but one level of treatment, I mean, there's, you know, there's antibiotics, there's antimicrobial herbs, there's functional medicine shoring up your wellness to the point where disease can't flourish, there's managing uh, side effects and Herxheimer reactions and all that. All of those are super important and we deal with that stuff. But another super important thing that we see time and time and time again in clinical practice is that people's limbic systems are stuck on high alert. And when you're stuck on high alert, your every threat is gonna be amplified to 11, right? So you smell something and your body shuts down. That those are people with multiple chemical sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, the people with electromagnetic uh, sensitivity. A lot of people have electromag, they can sense electromagnetic fields, mm -hmm. but it doesn't crush them. But when you get this limbic um, amplification, any novel experience crushes you. And well, guess what happens when you get a line bloom? That's a very novel experience and it crushes you deeply, right? So if we can turn down the amplifier, you cannot have such crushing experiences. Mm -hmm. And so go to our website. I put the website in the chat. It's justbewell.info rebalance dash to dash heal. And the whole program's lined out there. Like I said, you can or you can or you don't have to buy the supplements. You can and you don't have to buy the M Wave device from us. You can buy it from somewhere else. It's there. It's for you to use. And it's very powerful. And if you want coaching on the program, we'd, of course, we'd love it if you buy this stuff from us. It helps us pay the rent. Um, and if you want to buy coaching from us, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. It's there for you to use. All right. Thank you for being on, um, and we will uh, see you Thursday, I guess, at uh, 11 a.m. Central on Facebook Live. We'll talk to you then. Unless you have any questions. <clears throat> yep. If you have questions, now's the time. I think we've answered a lot of them, but uh, we'll go from there. I'll count to 10. <laughs> All right. Good night.